Uh, I'm going to call uh, our next uh, panel moderator, uh, Jacob Hallenkrutz. Welcome, Jacob. Thanks. Jacob is this group CEO of uh, EPSI Rating and uh, is going to hold the next panel for us on transitions and transformations. How do you create an ecosystem? How can Sweden and India work together? The yeah. floor is yours, Jacob. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I'm also an uh, associated researcher here at Uppsala University and I've been interested in organizational change research for some 20 years and I, I guess uh, uh, we are uh, uh, you know we live in a world of uncertainty and change and we are running a little bit out of time so let's keep this short and swift and crisp so um, I guess the core question is how can we together through ecosystems and networks uh, accelerate sustainable change so let's talk about that for the upcoming 30-ish minutes. So uh, welcome uh, Cecilia Oskarsson, uh, the Trade Commissioner of uh, Sweden in India. Welcome. A little applause, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks. And uh, Viral Takir, welcome back again, partner and leader of sustainability and climate at Deloitte. Yes. And I also have a, a fellow researcher colleague from the Swedish Institute for Quality, Professor Anders Fundin. Welcome. Yes, a big round of applause. <laughs> Sujit, welcome back. Welcome back. And uh, also Henrik Johansson, welcome back, CEO at Spaudi. Uh, and last but not least, Henrik Aspengren, researcher and project leader at Utrikespolitiska Institutet, whatever that is in English. <laughs> All right, uh, just the f first round. Please come back and we will have this nice and cozy Almedalen session here. So, so um, uh, uh, and I also like this Lord of the Rings metaphor that we have had this morning. Are we close to Mordor? What do we say about that? Or are you hopeful? Let's have a first check-in. Sting, testing, testing. <laughs> yes, we have, uh, we have sound. No? no? Yeah, no. Yep. Yeah, but let's just uh, share share microphones. After all, we are collaborating, aren't we? So um, uh, just just a quick check-in on, on, on the topic as such, as such. What's your sort of top of mind? Uh, accelerating transformation through ecosystems. What's your first sort of take on that, if you just have a little check-in? Okay, uh, absolutely. I think ecosystems and platforms, that's the way to spearhead the collaboration, but also uh, sustainability and the change and the green transition transformation that is necessary, especially in India. And I think when we work together, uh, India and Sweden, that's the way forward. So uh, all for it. Uh, I also think today that uh, uh, sustainability thoughts is nothing that you can do if you want, if you wish. It's a necessity nowadays, so you need to be there yep. and you need to be prepared to, to also take a little bit of uh, after give for, for that. So yes, for sure. So Mordor is getting closer, but you're hopeful. Absolutely. Yes. I'm, I'm always hopeful. That's good. Mm. Viral, what's your take on it? You, you uh, collaborate a lot with senior executives on the globe. So, uh, you know, as, as all of you might know, all the analysis that needs to be done on climate change has already been done. Uh, the pathways are very clear. Uh, the challenge is how do we limit uh, the effects of climate change to 1.5 degrees or as close to possible, right? So all of the talking, thinking has been done. Now is the time for action. Action by definition will mean people exploring different ideas, some that might fail but rapidly discovering what works and scaling at, you know, globally because we're all connected. So uh, if Sweden is completely transitioned to net zero, but the rest of the world hasn't, Sweden is still gonna be impacted. So that, that point remains for each and every country out there. So the, the name of the game is going to be collaboration, networking, and really bringing ideas to scale as quickly as possible. Yeah. Thanks. Anders, how can we close the knowing-doing gap? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for that question, Jakob. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much into, as previous seminars we had this morning on, on um, the inner life of organizations. How can we be more adaptable, uh, adaptable to change, uh, being able to adapt to and, and 
cope with the change that we cannot affect. Actually, we we are we need to take care of the change internally in organizations. And I always come back to, yeah, we we have a certain structure, organization, uh, teams, team leaders, managers. They probably have some kind of systematics with improvements, uh, plan, do, check, act, learning cycles, uh, in the best cases. But what we often, it, it's easy to forget, but also that I think is also uh, probably one of the main challenges, but probably the ones that need to give uh, most priority to is the organizational culture. So how do we work uh, with co-workers uh, and members in the organization to really include them in, in the change work internally? Now I talk about the organizational internally, uh, organizational change work. So I think that is my, um, yeah, my, my big interest, but I also think it's a very big concern still. Thanks. Yep. So Jeet, uh, yes, just, yeah, it's uh, we all, we have a lot of options, you know. Yeah, I know we have, have I'm like hooked to one and have two to access, but probably I'll speak louder directly. <laughs> yeah, so I think I probably come from uh, the perspective that we have been adopting in India on the digital infrastructure side, and I think few elements of that playbook, which I think probably can we can look at evaluating for some of these problems. I think with India in the last 15 years, as you heard from Mo, there's been a corridor for both problems and opportunities, right? All the big world problems go through India in some way or the other. Uh, so having that access always helps. Uh, but the way I think we sort of looked at these problems and solve is one, um, don't solve alone, distribute that ability to solve. I think that's what the whole building block DPA approach is. So we need to find a way to replicate that across multiple other disciplines. That's one that I can think of. The second thing, most of these problems are the, where the scale is a feature, it's not a bug, right? So you have to focus on solving at scale. Uh, small little pockets of excellence or one corner optimizing and the other. So therefore, I think fundamentally the, the approach what we can look at is to not think about scaling what works, but think of what works at scale. And again, that's the reason why we have DPIs. I don't know, there's this, this kind of an interesting, funny analogy. They're saying that the fact that COVID virus is a single strand DNA, all it took all it would have taken to avoid the pandemic is for people to stop breathing for five minutes or 10 minutes. But the fact that we cannot breathe, we have the pandemic, stop breathing. And, and that's the fact that it's, it's a very small thing, but it used an irresistible medium of human breath to spread. But if you can use it for positive. So with UPI, I say UPI is the digital COVID virus that use irresistible medium of mobile phones to create 9.5 billion transactions a month. So we need to find a much more scalable, low footprint solutions to solve for this and distribute that ability to solve. I mean, these are some of the cues that I could use to probably look at these problems. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Hendrik and Hendrik, let's start with Hendrik and Spaudi. What's your take on this? Accelerating change through ecosystems. In including. Including. Including, yeah, and, and, and guts to do things. Yeah. Because we have already heard and, and we know data is there. We know the problems, we know all of that. So it's about making a decision and try. Mm. So when we did this innovation in our company, I, I sat there with an idea and I said, let's try to do this. And everyone said, it's impossible. So, of course it is. yeah, of course it is. That's why we should do it because no one has done it before and we think that this could be a solution on a big problem and that big problem needs big thinking. So, and big thinking will not happen if you do it alone. Big thinking will happen if you talk with a lot of people and you engage with a lot of people. Uh, I'm thinking on some of the biggest inventions that we all are using daily. How come we are using that daily? Well, because it has delivered something of value that is here and now. So I think working with, like we do with innovation, we need guts to do and trial and error. And that means we need guts to do wrong and we need to learn from doing that. Uh, and we need to continue on our path forward, never give up and include, include everyone in, in your work. And everyone is, is, you know, we're talking about India and Sweden. 
I mean, I'm not talking about India and Sweden. I never do that. I, I'm talking about engaging with people, no matter who and where. I think that is the, the mindset. I'm coming from the mindset point of view on this. Yeah. Thank you. Henrik, would you like to... Thank you. So I'm a trained historian working in the field of international relations. So at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. So I, I would take a helicopter view of this. I think I do think about you know India, uh, and I do think about Sweden, and I think it's really interesting to look at India from the specific point we are in history, because India's rise in the global system is for the first time ever. Um, a power that will be propelled by green growth in the coming decades. I think that's really important to have in mind here. Also, it's the first time in history where uh, a power will r be rising, uh, where digital is really integrated in, in the rise. So we are on uncharted grounds here, and I think that is really striking. And it's also a time where the region, India and the Indo-Pacific, are not only takers of technology, as it has been you know, previously in history, um, this region is in the forefront um, and co-producers. And this is also something we need to think about in our discussion about how we collaborate in the innovation systems. Thanks. Uh, we also have a lot of good concrete examples. Cecilia, could you share with us examples where Sweden, India industry is given, we, we, we have seen these green sustainable transitions taking place. Absolutely. As we all know, India and Sweden have uh, today ce celebrating 75 years of diplomatic relations. And we also have quite a few MOUs. Might be a bit bureaucratic, but sometimes that is also the, the way to get the wheel spinning. And there are a few very successful MOUs, especially within energy, environment and sustainable um, <coughs> urban development that we should baseline out of. Uh, I think also we know Sweden has really uh, been able to grow in a sustainable way, keeping up the economic uh, w winning, and that is something I do believe that we, we can, can uh, co-create and, as you also said, continue to develop together with India, but in an Indian context. So having said that, in India, to, we at Business Sweden, together with the Embassy of Sweden and the Consulate and also Energy Agency, we have created what we call the Sustainability Show, uh, uh, Sweden Sustainability by Sweden. Uh, and this is really an um, umbrella, umbrella organization wherein we have a few different pillars. One is the India Sweden Innovation Accelerator Program, where actually Spaudi has been one of our uh, um, companies. Uh, it's a program that's been going on for more than a decade. That itself shows that uh, it's super eff effective and uh, successful. Uh, we have by now introduced more than 60 sustainable uh, energy solutions into India. And again, it's not about implementing the Swedish solution directly. It's about co-creation and adapting the Swedish solution to the Indian environment to make it po possible as, to use. That is one pillar. Another pillar that we just recently started is the Green Transition Partnership, where we, uh, together with the Indian industry, take Swedish industry and again co-create solutions adapted to the Indian environment and also in the long run to the Swedish environment to help um, making sure that not only India will be carbon neutral but also making sure that Sweden can keep up the good face that we already have. Lovely. So co-creation is a key word. Viral, you're out there in the forefront talking to business leaders. How, how can we, could you sort of elaborate on critical stakeholders and how we can uh, enhance this co-creation even further? Indeed. <clears throat> so let me, take a, let me take a business view for a second. Um, so we, we meet you know, clients and, and, and we speak to some of the most senior stakeholders, board members, CEOs, etc. So from an Indian business perspective, there is broad understanding and appreciation for, um, you know, for the, the magnitude of challenge, but also the opportunity. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, if you look at 
uh, the various scenarios, and I'll you know there's a scenario RCP six, um, which corresponds roughly I think to three degrees rise in in temperature. If RCP six materializes uh, by 2070, uh, India will lose uh, on a cumulative basis 35 trillion dollars of GDP. Right? It'll, it's it has a potential to impact 80 percent of the of the of the economy displace some 45% of workers, right? Because coastal regions will be most impacted. And this is heat stress, low productivity, infrastructure stress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, if you take actions early, then there is an incremental opportunity of $11 trillion. So it's a, while there's a big uh, you know, issue, there's also an opportunity. And all of that, uh, you know, uh, the pathway, primary pathway is through decarbonization. 45% of that opportunity sits in decarbonization. And if you look at the net zero journey of any company, that there's that last 25, 26% that is not yet fully known because it's either, you know, sustainable aviation fuel or things like that that aren't yet available at scale. So there is a pathway that's, or there are several pathways that are possible. There's a little bit of that unknown. And it's the unknown that we really need to come together to solve. Mm. Uh, and, and both, um, you know, at the industry level and at the economy level, there is that appreciation. Um, India also, by the way, imports 80% of its energy needs. So it's also good for energy security. So it's a, it's a win-win in some ways. Um, so to that extent, uh, you know, um, the only way possible is through innovations mm. and uh, co-creating uh, with either startups, academia, and not just limiting it to India, but literally all over the world, yeah. in particular Sweden. So that's really the the thought process, at least yes. in my mind. Thanks, Anders. Uh, being a quality, being a research in the quality domain for some decades now, uh, and, and focusing on business models and business excellence. How can business models be used to to catalyze or or enable a sustainable change? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. We, uh, our latest research is that we we aiming for. Yeah, I'm representing the Swedish business excellence board model, uh, Swedish quality management model uh, from SIQ, Swedish Institute for Quality. And we, what we have done last year is to, I mean, looking at the results of a business excellence model, what do we want to achieve? We have five cornerstones there, or five dimensions. It's of course the customers and stakeholders, and it's of course the, co the co-workers, uh, but uh, we've also included the three dimensions of sustainability, economic, ec uh, social, and, and, and environmental sustainability. And we give um, we give them all three same credits, so it 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 has has to be a very and it's it that side it's tricky, but balance those three: social, environmental, and economic sustainability. It's not easy, but we we believe or think or looking at the research that the, that is the way forward. Uh, balance those three, and um, I think. I think that is the biggest change we have made in the business excellence model last 30 years. So that's um, um, and that that can be one way forward. But it's easy to uh, that those uh, sustainability dimension is uh, making profit of each other, and I think that is uh, not the way uh, to go. I think they have to be a combination of those and in a. In a balance. Yeah, so so we sort of yes. extend from from customer satisfaction to sort of societal prosperity and satisfaction. Yeah, exactly. And, and, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. We yeah. previously we talk about customer satisfaction. Now we we aiming for societal satisfaction, and that's sad. It's make it also more difficult how to measure customer satisfaction. What what is societal satisfaction? Um, when the number of stakeholders are increasing, uh, that's not just a single customer anymore. That's uh, so many more, and um, I th but that's the only way to go, I, I believe. Yeah, it's mul multiple mm. stakeholders to keep happy. Yes. But but Sujit, you you have also uh, we we heard you and talk about the the societal impact of digital transformation. Could you right. could you perhaps co com comment on that? Uh, can this be leveraged to a sort of a global or planetary scale? Or? 
Uh, f- so for sure, I think uh, Pramod actually spoke about some of the societal impact with this uh, public infrastructure. A few things that uh, seem to be coming in a more recent conversation with us and on the on the ideas of Beckin uh, to the point that we will also mention on the whole energy dependency. Uh, I mean, I'll just probably take this as an example to set a perspective of what we're talking about. Um, so we have an opportunity here to look at looking at our energy demand and looking at consumers becoming co-producers as microgrids. This is a conversation that's just me picking up. It's fascinating. Eventually, there is a transition to battery, EV charging, and battery in, con- battery-based energies across different fragmented units. The challenge, however, in harnessing them to bring energy back is this here fragmentation. Now, here's an opportunity for us to bring it together on a virtual decentralized energy warehouse and make that excess battery surplus available to kind of create local consumption and local production happen. It's a fine way of connecting the dots, aggregating through interoperability and not promoting an aggregator. The decentralized energy warehouse is a fascinating concept that a week ago we started picking up in conversation. And yeah, the work that we did with EV charging on Beckon, the same thing is using for that bidirectional energy flow. And that possibility, and somebody was saying, if you were to take account of all the battery energy reservoir India has, as of today, it's significant number in double digits of the installed capacity of energy in India. So that itself can cause significant displacement. If you go for localized energy grids, microgrids, energy cooperatives, we have the famous milk cooperative or Amul in India. So that's one of the ways which can be further replicated as we transition uh, to uh, you know, uh, non-carbon emissions. Yeah. Cool. And um, Henrik, Henrik number one, you, we talked about, uh, no, that's number two, you're number one. Uh, we talk about uh, inclusion and you also told, uh, we, we learned that the small whole farmers produce one third of the global food here and how, how, can, how can that be a sort of leverage, how can it be viable for, from an entrepreneur's point of view? Can, can it be sort of expanded also? Yeah, absolutely, for sure, I would say. If, if we can't fix that, that we will have a significant problem to handle. So we need to fix it. Um, and, and when talking about, we have heard something about the cloud and the IT and the, all of that. Big data, that is important because big data on that you can analyze and you can understand and you can build and you can leverage your own technology or whatever you work with your business model for example so <clears throat> this group that is remote very remote that we are working with we are putting an opportunity to them to provide big data among each other that is data in terms of best practice sharing uh, your knowledge but also um, sharing your needs so that that we can find a way to distribute what they need to grow even better in in the future so building communi- communities and make sure that the data is transparent so that people that sits around and have br- brilliant ideas have a network to hook into and they can go out and do some piloting uh, taking a region whatever and test it's all about you know, having to encourage to test, do the investment, initial invest, test, and give the, let people give the, the feedback, but not only to you. You need to share. Open source has to be also with your business model, as I see it. If we can have the guts to place our business model as an open source thing, I think we will be able to wo- walk a little bit faster. Mm. Cool. And um, there are a lot of opportunities out there, Hendrik. Uh, how can we uh, catalyze all this even further, even more? Right, I, I think if I would uh, uh, um, try to pick up on your um, Tolkien uh, metaphor yes. and, and try to... Uh, Who is Gollum? <laughs> yeah, try to connect all the dots here. I think, uh, and coming back to India, uh, I think um, we could think about India in the international relations as the Tom Bombadil. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows Tom Bombadil. It's an ancient figure in Tolkien's universe um, who is very independent minded. Um, and I think when we look at how India builds its uh, uh, part international partnerships, it is very independent minded. 
is not following any coalitions. So um, I think um, working with India on India's terms is, is very important. And uh, I will not do the global sort of outlook here, but uh, yeah, th those would be my parting words. Think about Tom Bombadil. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Sauron, by the way. But then, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think no one will, will, uh, will kill us if we actually wrap up a little early. So perhaps we will just uh, check out. If, if you would give us your best you know, uh, success factors and pitfalls, I think we all agree on that uh, we need to accelerate change and uh, that there is a knowing doing gap that needs to be closed and that there are both opportunities and threats out there. So, success factors and pitfalls when moving forward together. Yeah, I think uh, what we really need to, to take advantage of is what we heard earlier today, that there are an, a huge startup scene in India, and that we have gone from barely 500 startups just five, six, seven years ago, and we now see 75,000 startups, we see 105 unicorns. I think this is where we should tap in from the industry, the big industry names, which have been from a Swedish perspective in India for up to 120 years, like Ericsson, they should really tap into this startup scene. And the same goes opposite. The Indian conglomerates should use the Swedish startup scene and use the startups there to continue to spearhead the innovation, the sustainable innovation, but also the green transition. Thanks. Success factors and pitfalls from your viewpoint. So uh, let me talk about pitfalls for a second. Yes, uh, that's fun. Uh, yeah. You know, just to just to be the the, <laughs> the devil's advocate or the pessimist here. Uh, so uh, in my mind, uh, if we haven't, uh, if we don't set ourselves a specific target, right? So both input targets, output targets, and outcome targets. That in my mind would be. Um, uh, you know something that would limit us because uh, while I you know I don't believe in setting artificial targets, but we we do need to think about okay so with you know um, conglomerates on both sides, startups everywhere, can we have X startups that are talking to conglomerates? And sometimes you almost have to force you know uh, companies to come together with startups uh, if needed. Provide additional mentoring seed cap, you know, whatever that might be needed, but then really get people to commit to taking some of these actions forward, identifying the results, and then playing back, okay, this is what we what we achieved, and uh, can we take these learnings and scale? If not, it's okay to drop, but then let's move on to the next, almost creating cohorts uh, of some of these um, uh, incubation ideas. So that's that would be my kind of best case forward. If you don't do some of these, then it'll just be you know a lot of conversation. But yeah, 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 yeah. thanks. Anders. Okay, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, yeah, my takeaways from here also is uh, that there's some key words. It's um, uh, first is inclusiveness. Um, the second is uh, transparency. I heard that. I think that's two good words to that I bring uh, from here. And uh, pitfall. I think a pitfall could be to. Uh, I mean, being adaptable to change, um, cope with change. I think we we also need to see failure is is something good. So I, um, if we just do planning and planning and planning and don't do, uh, we we will never fail. Uh, so I, I will also take away that that fa failure could actually be the best teacher, being adaptable to change, trial and error. Thanks, Sujit. Yeah. So. Just three, four messages from my end. One, I think there has to be a scale thinking. Eh? There has to be almost like an obsession for scale. Uh, the problems are of that scale. So we need to look at scale. So uh, scale begets scale. If you can, so what UPI created, others are set in motion. So scale begets scale. You can cre create a complete revolution cycles of uh, non-exponential non -exponen growth. Second is, of course, uh, you need to look at uh, uh, yeah, this this idea of working collaboratively. Okay, you cannot be doing it alone. You have to work together, and and make sure that this inclusion and this there has to be a deep conviction for that. And not deep pockets always, but deep conviction. As you could see, the numbers we just spent a little less than a billion dollar to get something going. So it requires that 
And also think about when you're talking about big problems, it doesn't mean the solutions have to be big. The solutions could be small. The solutions, actually the footprint becomes smaller if you're wanting to solve exponential uh, scale problems. So those are three things that I would probably be mindful of uh, being part of this conversation. Thanks. One thing that makes me very interesting with, with um, India is the young population. And you said it, Cecilia, startups is coming every day. Mm -hmm. And I can ensure you the ones that are starting companies from generations like I'm three step behind them, they are thinking completely different completely different in how do they do business, how do they make decisions. Uh, open source for them was in their diapers when they were like this, you know. Uh, everything is one click away. I think we that are a little bit older, we need to adapt, we need to understand, we need to bring in these young people, we need to encourage them because the one that understands the power in their global thinking, because they have friends all over, and take advantage of that. I think we need perhaps one more generation to adapt, but then we will all sit in the back seat. And if we do understand that that will be the case, and we would like to be the driver, we need to encourage them, those people and those startups. I think it's quite crystal. Thanks. Um, well, I think um, doing what we are doing here today, perhaps uh, bringing together um, representatives from different sectors. So one sector that I miss out in this conversation is the political side. I think bringing policy, politics, uh, not politics as such, part of politics, but the political side to things, I think is also very important. So come together, uh, facilitate dialogue. Um, uh, I think that is uh, crucial. Thanks. So, wrapping up, collaboration, co-creation, uh, inclusion, and uh, transparency, thanks. And uh, do what we're about to do now, stop talking, start doing, perhaps. Uh, united we stand, uh, divided we fall. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm.